In this lecture, we will learn about stochastic volatility models. As you remember, Black-Scholes model is far away from perfect when we talk about the fit to implant volatility of small ions Q. Um, deficiencies of the Black-Scholes model can be fixed by, for example, adding jumps. However, in practice, in the industry, jumps are not often used. The biggest problem with inclusion of jumps is that the jump events are quite difficult to match. Also, the interpretation of the impact of a jump on the implied volatility shapes is not very straightforward. Today, we talk about alternative uh, stochastic volatility models. Um, those models are in a class of affine diffusion uh, models. And typically, when, once we talk about stochastic volatility, we talk about higher dimension than one. For that, we need more advanced techniques in order to obtain option prices, uh, to obtain implied volatilities in an efficient way. Uh, let's take a look at the closer at the content of today's course. Uh, first, I will provide you with motivation uh, for stochastic volatility, and I will introduce the stochastic volatility model of Heston. It is a two-dimensional uh, stochastic volatility model. Uh, once we talk about uh, two-dimensionality or high-dimensionality stochastic differential equations, you can imagine that Brownian motions also will be in a higher than, two, than one dimension. This means that we also have to handle how to deal with correlations, how to correlate Brownian motion, and how to uh, use such a correlation, how to impose correlation on Brownian motions. Um, and then we also need an extension of Ito's lemma. So far, we have learned about the Ito's lemma in 1D. Uh, here, I will introduce you uh, um, the Ito's application to the higher dimensional cases. Um, then um, the next step is the pricing PDE, so something that we have already done for the Black Scholes model. Here we will be following Martingale approach for the PDE computation, for the derivation for the PDE. Uh, although in this uh, lecture we are not focusing so much on uh, uh, um, PDE techniques to solve, uh, we will be concentrating more on Monte Carlo and Fourier transformations, which allow us for extremely fast computation, or actually Fourier transformations allow us for extremely fast computation of prices. Um, once we are, uh, we know how to, we have a model, we have defined the parameters and correlations, of course. Uh, we, have, we also have to take a look at the impact of the model parameters on implied volatility. So uh, can we actually understand the meaning and the impact of each of the Heston model parameters or stochastic volatility parameters on the impact volatility. And that's very important because once we understand the meaning of the parameters, it is very uh, useful once we want to manage the risks accordingly. So for example, if uh, you would like to hedge uh, risks associated with a curvature or a skew, then you, not nice, it would be good to know which parameter is responsible for it especially models with multiple parameters. Um, then we will look at the uh, uh, Black-Scholes model in comparison against Heston model. And finally, um, we will derive here characteristic function for the Heston model. In this lecture, characteristic function is not going to be used as such. However, later, once we talk about the Fourier transformation, characteristic function is something that is going to be very important ingredient once we talk about Fourier transformations and numerical techniques for solving, for obtaining prices in a very efficient manner. So far, we have learned how to extend the Black-Scholes model by using jumps. We have also learned about the construction of the affine jump diffusion class, which allows us to model uh, multiple, very different models that can be used to calibrate to implant volatility, smile, or skew. Uh, here is another picture. This is the implant volatility surface, which I have taken recently from the market. And uh, so let's take a look at what kind of, what parts of volatility surface we can calibrate in the, using the models we have learned so far. So um, in this direction, so here X axis, this is moneyness. Um, once you see market data and you can see, and you notice there is a word moneyness, it's typically associated with a strike which is divided by S0. So this means that you can see in percentage, essentially, how far uh, off, how far away is your uh, strike relative to initial stock. Uh, in this way, if, you, if the market moves a lot, for example, it moves in uh, upwards and downwards, if you use this measure for a strike, for moneyness, uh, 
then your smile does not really depend on a level, but depends on the percentage of how much away are you from the add the money. So basically, how much you are away from one. So for add the money options, add the money, you have one. So this is nicely, always you have a scale, you can think of a, a smile, which is always scaled to one. And that's typically uh, associated, it's named moneyness. Then we have also here in this graph expiry and volatility level. So you see that the range of volatilities in this case for this volatility surface is from 15.1 up to 60. Using Black Scholes model, so we would have uh, uh, expiry for given expiry. Using Black Scholes model, we are only able to calibrate to one particular point. So as you can see that if you have a whole surface and you have a Black Scholes model, this surface that Black Scholes is able to calibrate is only one particular point. And everywhere else, the implied volatility will be basically flat. So it's a flat implied volatility surface. That's definitely not enough if we think of a pricing of a derivative, which would depend on more places, more points on a surface. So how you can think about it, imagine a payoff that depends on, uh, that's path dependent, basically. So your, um, uh, your path, for example, changes in time, and then the distribution you're interested, so your payoff would depend on the distribution, transition distribution in time. If you think of European options, we only, uh, the payoff only depends on one given spot, only one given point in time. So that's the, that's, the depend, that's the difference. So if your payoff, which would depend only on this particular point, then Black Scholes very likely would be enough. If we have a payoff, which would depend on the time evaluation and also strike direction, then indeed the, the whole surface, it is necessary to be well calibrated. Um, the question, of course, could why you want to have a calibration of the model and then to particularly here to this implied volatility surface which is calculated from pause inputs so imagine you have a payoff which is path dependent but now somebody asks you could you calibrate to a call input option it doesn't really make sense to think about it because you are interested in a pricing of a derivative and not an put or call option however how this is done in finance is typically uh, uh, most liquid products that are available, especially volatility products, are call and put options. This means that uh, those instruments can be used to calibrate your model. If you have an exotic derivative that you like to price, very likely, because it's exotic, it's not very liquid. This means that there are not too many derivatives uh, of that con construction available in the market. This means that you will be very likely unable to calibrate your model to that exotic derivative. So what we typically do in finance, we calibrate to liquid instruments, calls and puts, whatever is available, and we extrapolate, you can think of extrapolation, to a price of exotic derivative, given that, have, uh, uh, given that you calibrate to Europeans' calls and puts. Uh, on the other hand, you can also think that if you have a payoff which is proof dependent, and if you think of terms of hedging, essentially you would use simple products like for example calls and puts to hedge your exotic instrument for that reason if you think of hedging you also want to have a well calibrated hedging instruments because otherwise you cannot really uh, map your in, uh, exotic derivative to those simple products so if you have here uh, this is basically black shoals model if we would uh, extend black shoals model with uh, time dependent volatility and then essentially we could be able to calibrate to this slice here. This is time dependent volatility sigma time t. This is for Black Scholes case. If we would have, um, uh, for example, jump, other jump, then we could have a smile or skew. And very likely that smile or skew will persist in time. However, if we won't be able to get this kind of uh, time fluctuation of smile. And that's not, uh, that's not easy to calibrate if we think of a Black Scholes model only included extended with, uh, with a jumps. Uh, today we will talk about stochastic volatility models, which actually allow us to calibrate to this volatility surface. The calibration is not perfect, and this will be also discussed in this course. However, it is a market practice, and it's basically those models that we discuss in this course, those are very popular to uh, and actually very good, uh, sufficiently good to calibrate to this, this type of surface. Uh, today we talk about Heston model, 
So uh, Python model, if we see a, a surface like this, when there is not too much peaks in implied volatility uh, smile, the Heston model will perform very, very well. If we have a, a much more steep smile in the beginning of um, our surface and then will dissolve, then uh, likely we will need to have a model which also includes jumps. But this will be also presented uh, in this lecture. So we, before we discussed model of jumps, this is uh, definitely that would not be enough to, uh, to calibrate to the whole surface. Stochastic volatility will, and local volatility models that we are not going to discuss in this course, it's also able to calibrate to this uh, surface. However, technically, although it's one dimensional, it's more involved to uh, maintain and implement. We have already learned before that once we talk about a model, when we specify a system of uh, equations, we always have to think in terms of a market. So again, we start with uh, some stock dynamics. We have a discounting process to money savings account. We have a P measure by switching from to Q measure to risk neutral measure. We have a, a, a process in which drift is uh, uh, corresponding to the drift is corresponding to the money savings account here. Uh, let's go back for a moment. If we think of a pricing of this uh, call and put options, pricing of options is always under risk use for measurement. If you would be looking at the prices of options, let's say in a historical time series, then indeed we can talk about P measure. But if the surface is implied from market instruments that currently are quoted, then we talk about the risk new measure. So keep, always keep that in mind. Uh, risk neutral measure is always implied from market instruments and, and P measure, so real world measure, it's always calculated based on the historical data. Um, possible extensions for the Black Scholes model to make it better, it is uh, right now we have constant interest rates, we can make it time dependent. Um, interest rate does not really, um, by making stochastic or time dependent, uh, interest rates, we are not going to improve smile or skew, it is not going to be uh, improved, or we are not going to generate an skew or smile. By having time-dependent sigma, as already discussed, we can calibrate to the term structure of volatilities. So we cannot have a smile, you cannot have skew, but you can have under money implied volatility uh, fit. Or not necessarily only at the money, because for example, if you choose different uh, slice, you could also calibrate to different uh, uh, different levels. So you, if you choose different strike levels, you'll be able to calibrate uh, different levels. However, every time you choose different uh, time-dependent volatility, that would require a different model. So basically means that if you would like to have those slices, uh, Black Scholes with time-dependent volatility is only able to calibrate to one of them. So in this case, you will have multiple of them needed. And of course, difficult part will be how to kind of glue them together. So that's rather impossible and for that reason we use models like uh, stochastic volatility or log volatility. Um, so dependence making interest rate stochastic does not really help us in calibration to implant volatility smile on skew. However, if we think of volatilities and we make sigma time stochastic or local volatility, uh, also um, that would be involving sigma, then actually this is discussion for today that in, so we deal with a stochastic volatility. So if our volatility parameter is stochastic, we call it stochastic volatility model. Um, mod modeling volatility as random var is confirmed by practical data. And this is also what we have already discussed uh, before, that uh, volatility uh, is in a model of Black-Scholes, we are missing uh, enough degrees of freedom to calibrate well to implant volatility surface. Uh, there are multiple choices regarding the models. So we have, for example, Cool White with stochastic volatility, Stain and Stain, Aston, which is uh, of particular interest, and Shobel Zoo. We are not going to compare those models to each other. They are, uh, th th let's say, they are in, from the same family of models where volatility is stochastic. We could have, for example, normal volatility coefficient and some other variants of, uh, uh, of Shobel Zoo model. Um, in a Heston model, in particular, uh, we will consider a model which is uh, which volatility it is uh, mean reverting square root process. Um, what that means is that if we think of uh, if we go back here, 
um, if we define a stochastic differential equation for sigma, and the sigma, for example, we can define it as a normal process. So, for example, we have it d sigma t is equal to some, uh, let's call it a d t plus b times d w t. Uh, as you can see, the sigma process, it, it is stochastic. We can also make this Brownian motion here correlated with this Brownian motion. However, the problem here would be that you can see that volatility in our case would become negative and that it is uh, not really realistic when once we talk about the volatility. Square root process, we will give you more details later on. Uh, it is driven by the Cox Ingersoll process defined in the 18, 1985. The advantage of this uh, process is that it has a uh, fat tails, so CIR or uh, uh, mean reverting square root process has fat tails and it's non-negative, which is very uh, beneficial once we talk about uh, uh, volatilities. Um, the model was officially and initially used for interest rates. However, it is in, in, uh, as we uh, uh, currently use those models, uh, interest rates can become negative, so that's not so much popular anymore. Uh, simple model of full white is uh, more suited for interest rates. However, uh, CIR process become very popular once we talk about modeling volatilities. And return distributions under stochastic volatility typically is a bit fatter tails. So uh, obviously, once we talk about fitting to the uh, implied volatility smile, uh, we need tails which are flexible and they're fatter than just the log normal uh, counterparts. Otherwise, we will not be able to calibrate the market. The most important element of the Hester model is its stochastic volatility structure. So we know that the volatility under the Heston model is stochastic. So um, in the Heston, we had, uh, as you can see, we have a square root of VT, and VT is driven by the following differential equation. So uh, actually, when we talk about the process for VT, we talk about the process for variance of the Heston model. So variance for, for the Heston model is driven by the CIR process. Uh, with some effort, you should be able to show that variance at any point t, so any point given point, it fo uh, follows the following distribution. So it's a constant, which is given here, so it's a, a function of model parameters, times non-central high square distribution with d degrees of freedom and lambda, which is the, uh, the parameter of non-centrality parameter. And of course we always consider uh, time t uh, bigger than zero. Here we have also some description of the parameters. So this is dependence, how those parameters depend on uh, how function C, D, and lambda depend on model parameters. Uh, what is also important to mention here is that here we talk about uh, distribution, given that we have some initial point, you can see V0, right? So once we specify initial point, so if you would have a pound here, you have time zero, we have a value, v0 here, then we think of this distribution is a transition distribution to this point. So here we know this will be a distribution which is given by this equation. Mm -hmm. So we have a non-central high square distribution. However, if we would substitute this v0 with uh, even a vector or samples or uh, um, a random variable at any given point in the future, then we actually would have a v t given Vs, so we could say it's a transition uh, a random variable, and then the only thing that we have to change is V0 we change with Vs, and also we change time everywhere that we have t, we will need to change it with a t minus s. But this is not so uh, important at this point, this will be quite important once we talk about efficient simulation of the Heston model. Um, the square root process for the variance precludes negative values. So as we expected, the variance should not become negative. So it's uh, always positive value. However, we have uh, some technical condition that we have to uh, check or once this condition is not satisfied, then we may encounter some numerical issues. So it's always good to take a look. If you have calibrated your model, you have model parameters, 
it's always good to check whether the condition, so-called failures condition, is satisfied or not. If it's a condition is satisfied, so this means that 2 times kappa mean reversion times long term mean is bigger or equal gamma squared, so it's volatility squared. So you mean that uh, proportionally uh, mean reversion and long term mean, so we are kind of far away from zero and it's a very fast mean reversion. It's proportionally bigger than the volatility squared, vol vol squared. Then this condition is satisfied. This means that the paths will become will be far away from zero or sufficiently far from zero. If this condition is not satisfied, what well, this means that if we have Monte Carlo paths, if you have simulation from V zero, those paths at some point they can hit zero and bounce back. So it's a the boundary condition for failure condition not satisfied. Is attainable. This is how it's called. So you can imagine paths are going like this. And then there is a hit and then goes away. If failure is satisfied, this will not happen. If failure condition is not satisfied, then this can happen. Um, once we talk about the non central high square distribution, in essence, we talk about the summation of a normally distributed random variables. So as you can see, we have a, a we get C times non-central high square distribution with D degrees of freedom, and we had also a lambda of bar. So we you can imagine that we have a D random variables which are independent, normally distributed, with some mean and variance. Then the random variable of this form, so summation until uh, D bar of scaled those random variables D variables uh, X D. It follows non-central high square distribution, so this is why it's also it's guaranteed to be non-negative once we talk about uh, non-central high square distribution. Uh, D bar, which specifies number of degree of freedom, so this is the number of elements we have in the summation here, and uh, lambda bar. Um, this is typically associated with uh, scaled parameters. So if those variables x i they have mu. Uh, mean and variance sigma squared, then lambda would be typically summation of all of them uh, with mu i divided by sigma i squared. Um, for non-central high square distribution or for CIR uh, random variable, we also know uh, properties so we can calculate distribution CDF and PDF. For CDF, if we just follow the definition, so FVT of at given point x, uh, then we just define, use the definition. Then if we substitute, so remember we had a C times non-central high squared, we just divided our X by the C. And then we know that if we are interested in a, um, this CDF for CIR, for our process CIR at any given point, we essentially have to scale our argument. So if you're interested at X equal to two, then you basically have to divide it by CT. Um, Non-central high square CDF, it is rather involved. So as you can see, it involves infinite summations of exponents and we have also gamma functions. So as you can see, this is rather complicated, uh, but I would not be worried because uh, every numerical package, even with a Python, MATLAB, whatever you're using, uh, those functions are considered standard. So distribution for um, CIR process for non-central high square is very likely implemented and in implemented efficiently. Because as you can imagine, if you have an infinite sum, that could be quite expensive. But these days, packages of, have those functions implemented very well. If we talk about the density, um, we can just differentiate and we could get uh, the following term. Then we actually have something which is, this is rather straightforward. But then we have a, a Bessel function that it is much more involved. However, this is also available uh, in packages. Um, we are not going to use density so much. If we talk about the pricing, we could indeed use the density if we talk about integration of a, of a payoff, but we make use of the characteristic functions in our, uh, uh, in our lecture. Therefore, this is not going to be used so much. Uh, here are two graphs I have prepared. Um, those figures here correspond in particular to to the failure condition satisfied and not satisfied. So on the left hand side figure, you can see uh, variance paths and failure condition, it is satisfied. So you can see paths are, so we have a long term mean around this level, right? So it's 0 0.1. We have a paths which are kind of oscillating around that level. 
and the black here, the curve, it indicates a density that we would have. This density here, I also actually have generated with a non-central high score distribution. This is also available in every package that if you would like to, to see these uh, densities. So you can see that it's, everything is very smooth, everything behaves very nicely. If we, on the other hand, consider maybe something more to mention, you see that zero level is at this point. None of the paths that we have generated goes reaches zero. So we are far away from zero, failure is satisfied. On the other hand, if we have a, a failure not satisfied, this means that uh, gamma squared, so vol vol parameter, is substantially bigger than two times kappa v bar, then we don't have a condition satisfied. Then you can see that Monte Carlo paths, they hit zero. So actually you can see here, you can see here multiple places, zero is attainable. Paths, they don't stay at zero. So there are actually stochastic models like Saber model, where path would hit zero and stay at zero. In this case, we have a, a volatility hits zero and may uh, it always bounces. On the other hand, if we look at the density, so you see this density initially, it's very nice. It's very smooth. This is related to the fact that once we are starting simulation from a clo time close to zero, the density is still within the limit. So it does not, if we just go one time step from initial point, the density sh should not explode. However, if you go further in time, you see that the density, it's not anymore uh, smooth. It's very peaked. So there is a lot of probability mass around zero. This is why we see this density going extremely, uh, extremely high. And of course, uh, um, something very important to keep in mind that if you calibrate your model, Heston model, to market data, unfortunately, in most of the cases, this is the set of parameters that you will have. So this means that uh, in reality, once we use the model and we calibrate to market data, we don't have nice paths that they are far away from zero. We actually have much fatter tails, as you can see here. And there is a, um, a market, essentially, you can say, enforces those parameters which are not failure satisfied. So this is uh, something to keep in mind. So often when I read an article and somebody assumes from the beginning that failure condition that in his research, failure conditions are satisfied. Typically, it's a big limitation for the model because this means that market will not that the model will not calibrate very well to the market data, and this is something important to keep in mind. Here is another graph I have prepared. So this is more about the densities. So here on the left hand side, uh, we have defined uh, QF. So this is again the the, the failure condition. And you can see how the density, it's either smooth when failure condition is satisfied or it is basically exploding when it's not satisfied. It is the same for CDF. So we have a, a CDF which goes nicely towards one and we have a CDF which actually start, you can see, from around 0 0.1. This means there's a lot of paths that actually were close to zero and they were bouncing. So there's a lot of accumulation around zero and then the CDF nicely goes uh, so far we have discussed models involving multiple stochastic differential equations, but we never go into detail about how to correlate those processes. Um, when we talk about uh, stochastic differential equations in multi-dimension, it's always the case of multi-dimensionality. Uh, an another element which is very important is that once we talk about uh, correlation, in stochastic differential equations, typically the correlations is included in the model via Brownian motion. Of course, we have also learned about models involving jumps, but typically jumps are considered to be independent. Otherwise, the, mod the problem that we have to deal with, it's too involved and uh, uh, too also difficult to understand. How, for example, you could think of a correlation between a jump and diffusion. So that's, that's rather difficult. So typically jumps are considered to be independent. Um, so Brownian motion is the element that we correlate if we have more than one stochastic differential equation. So there are multiple uh, properties that need to be satisfied. Uh, first one uh, is that if we talk about correlated Brownian motions, uh, we need to have an expectation for um, product of a WIT and WJT. So those are possibly uh, there are two different Brownian motions. 
and the correlation, this expectations equal to correlation of i, j, t, in the case of i equal to j. How to see it? Um, let us take a look into the um, note. So um, once we talk about correlation, by definition, we have an expectation of a Brownian motion i. So maybe it's, I should write it nicer. W i from t times W j from t. Right, then we have a minus expectation of W i t times expectation of W j t. And of course, um, in denominator, we have a square root of a variance of W i t times variance W j of t. So we know that since we deal with a, a Brownian motion, then the expectations, those two expectations are equal to zero. So this one is zero and this one is zero. This is by property of Brownian motion. Um, if we look at x variance, so each of these elements, we know the variance for Brownian motion is typically t. So we have also here uh, t. So we have a t squared, which is a square root uh, of t squared. Essentially, this means that we have an expectation of w i t times w j of t divided by t. So as you can see, if you multiply this equation from both sides by t, we have a correlation times t equals to expectation of w i t times w j of t. So this is the relation. Once we talk about correlated Brownian motions, this is the relation that needs to hold. OK, um, of course, if we have a i is equal to uh, j, so we have only uh, essentially variance, because first moments are equal to 0, then we have only t. Um, if we switch from Brownian motions into increments, the similar properties need to hold. So we need to have d w i t d w j t then is simply as you can see correlation times d t so this is similar uh, as we had for uh, ethos table and this is the case for i equal to j of course if we have i equal to j then we only have d t because then correlation is equal to one on the other hand if we talk about independent um, brown emotions typically we indicated by uh, you can see a, a, a wave here right so we have a tilde and then we have a Brownian motion because they are independent. Then we have an expectation of a product is equal to product of expectations. Then it's zero. And then if uh, i is equal to j, then we have again the same case as we had before for correlated for a correlated case, which is correlated to one. Then we have a variance of t. And for the uh, independent increments, of course, if the correlation is equal to zero, we have a zero dt, right? So this is just zero. And in the case when we have an i equal to j is dt. So this is rather uh, straightforward, those relations. Uh, the only one element that you need to remember is this quantity here. And then once we talk about uh, uh, increments like a dwi, we talk about uh, product in L2. This is why this is related in this expression it is related to this expectation. The details about this relation you can find in, uh, in the book. Uh, however, this is basically, this should be enough um, to, uh, let's say, consume and to process stochastic differential equations involving correlated processes. So, okay, so um, let us imagine we have uh, two brown emotions. So as you can see, we have uh, two independent ones because we have tilde, and we would like to correlate them with a correlation raw one, two. So typically, this is how we indicate correlations 1, 2. This means we have two processes that we want to correlate them. The technique that we are going to use, it's so-called Cholesky decomposition. I'm pretty sure that many of you, or all of you, are familiar with that. If not, uh, please take a look at the properties and how this Cholesky decomposition is constructed. Uh, Cholesky decomposition essentially allows us that if we have a correlation matrix, so we know that we have a, a on diagonals, we have ones and we have a correlations on the counter diagonal. If we apply Cholesky decomposition to this uh, positive definite uh, matrix, then we end up with a product of two uh, lower uh, uh, lower matrices. Yeah? So if you if you multiply them together, then you end up with um, this correlation matrix. Uh, 
Uh, and what is very nice is that if we have this, uh, if we take one of them, so we have L here, it's a lower triangular matrix, but we also have a lower triangular matrix. And if we, that actually, this should be a transposed, right? So if we have a, a lower triangular matrix and we multiply with independent brown emotions, so you see that we have a, this row multiplied by this column, we have brown emotion, the first one, and the second row multiplied by the uh, by the column here, we have this expression. Uh, now we end up with a, a vector. As you can see in the first term, it's a, a first independent brown emotion. And in the second term, we have uh, two brown emotions. The first one from the first equation, and the second one is independent one. And of course, the question is, if we have a, a vector, for example, W1T, w2 t where we had a correlation row between those brown emotions whether the correlation row we also would have between those two terms this is an exercise we have to do um, for a moment let's assume that this is the case but you see that this is a really nice construction because in the first row you have let's say you simulate a process which is kind of independent then in a second if you simulate a second process you take the result from the first one and then you correlate it, so the second part, it is about a combination of process that you have generated plus independent process that you have uh, sampled. And OK, so let's now go to the uh, an expression, right? So we have, uh, we know that this term is equal to the this term, right? Because this is just the first uh, process. Now we need to check whether the, uh, the correlation between these two is the same as we would have correlation between these two terms. So, of course, the, what we need to check is the following. So, we have a Brownian motion, uh, first one and the second one. Uh, so, okay, this is the simplification. So, for the first Brownian motion, we define as the independent one, and the second one is defined as the, uh, as the second row. So, we, sorry, we, we take the first Brownian motion equal to this term. We have a second Brownian motion equal to the second row. And we need to check whether the correlation between the two is the same. Right? So this is just a slightly different notation. So, okay, so what we are interested, of course, is the covariance, because the, we know that the moments um, are, uh, are, are given. So basically, once the, co the covariance holds, is essentially equivalent with uh, a correlation. So we have, uh, by definition, we will have an expectation of a first Brownian motion, second one, and this is just a for the definition of the covariance. Now what we do, we substitute. So for the first one, we substitute independent one. For the second one, we take the, uh, the second term, which is here, right? Then we have a zero because we have a two uh, independent uh, brown emotions, right? So uh, we know that this expectation of all of, both of them, even if we have like, so if we substitute this expression here, we know that the first term will be zero, and the second term naturally is zero because we use the linear of ex linearity of expectation is also zero. So this, this is gone. Now we have uh, um, the following term. So we will have for the first term we have a correlation which is constant. We take it outside the expectation, and we have a first Brownian motion squared. For the second term we have also one minus uh, rho squared under square root takes. We take it outside the expectation, and we have a product of two Brownian motions. Of course, we know that those two Brownian motions, by definition, are independent. So this means that we can write it in this way, right? So we have a correlation um, of the uh, second moment of the first Brownian motion, independent Brownian motion, and we have here product of two independent expectations uh, of uh, uh, Brownian motions. We know that those expectations are simply zero again, because those are independent ones. So we end up with an expression that uh, this term is equal to correlation between the first and second brown emotion times the expectation of the second moment and that's equal to the variance and we proved that uh, the final result is equal to the correlation between the first and second one so as you can see we started we know that uh, the correlation between first and second brown emotion is equal to raw right so by substituting to independent and using this relation in the derivations we end up with the same uh, conclusion. We end up with the same result that the output should be uh, raw 1, 2, t.
So this means that this decomposition here that we have obtained, it essentially gives us exactly the same properties. So we have a correlation and moments are preserved. Uh, so this means that we can, if we find it uh, more suitable, we can switch between using of uh, two correlated Brownian motions to using of two independent Brownian motions. So the first one is the Brownian motion here, the second one is here, and we correlate them using the Cholesky decomposition. So this is uh, very handy, especially later you will notice that dealing with uh, independent Brownian motions is much more beneficial than dealing with uh, correlated Brownian motions. Now let's take a look at uh, uh, some samples. So here we will have, um, um, I have generated uh, three graphs. The first one we have for the, um, so this is the case where we have a correlation equal to uh, negative correlation, right? So you can see one path goes down, second one goes up. Then the second term, we can see the correlation is uh, uh, zero. So this is one goes up, it's like very random to, to specify what is the uh, correlation between the, the paths. And for the third one, you can see the correlation is positive. So uh, if one goes up, second also goes up. So the population is positive. Um, now let's take a look how to program it, because at the end you are, we are interested in, uh, in simulating those correlations. So let's, let's take a look at the, at the code. So uh, again, let's start from the main piece of code. We have, uh, uh, we define number of paths. So I just define number of paths per process is one. So for, we have two Brownian motions, W1 and W2. And for each of them, we generate only one path. Then we have a uh, number of steps. It's a discretization. Time that we want to simulate is one year. And we have uh, three cases. So the first one is negative correlation. Then we have a positive correlation and third one is zero. So if we, if we go here, so we, our building block is that we generate fun. So we have a function, we generate paths. We have, of course, the configuration and only difference between uh, those three elements is the raw parameter. The rest it stays the same. And here in the generate Brownian motion paths, we have here um, the following. So we define two empty, uh, actually, sorry, here are the two uh, matrices of random samples. So as you can see, they are just independent. So those are just uh, randomly chosen from normally distributed random variable. Then we have uh, two empty matrices for uh, for storage. So typically it is desired that if you are sampling, uh, it's good to first uh, have an empty matrix and fill in with paths. Otherwise, if you have a if you always add row or always add column to a matrix, then it's unnecessary copying of the uh, object, and that is very expensive. So it's always, if possible, define empty object that you will fill in with, uh, uh, with a data. And then what we do, we do for every time step. So this is also, we have already discussed, every time step in, in time, we first uh, standardize our samples. So for every column, we make sure that the expectation of Z1 and expectation of Z2 are zero, and also variance of Z1 at every column, every time step, it ex variance is equal to one and is the same for Z2. At this point also, this standardization here does not Im influence the correlation. Uh, later in this course, you will learn more techniques about improving your simulation. So this is just uh, one of the simplest, the easiest ones to implement and handle that provides a better convergence of your simulation. Then what we do, we define actually, uh, so the, for the uh, Z1, we essentially take independent samples. So it's just a, a first column. And for Z2, what we have, we have a raw times uh, Z1 at every column times the square root one minus row squared times the second matrix. The second, actually, sorry, second vector. Uh, so you have Z1, vector i, and Z2, also vector i. And then if we talk about Brownian motion, so we have now at this point correlated noises. So those are the just uh, noises or correlated uh, samples from uh, multivariate normal distribution. Uh, and now what we do, uh, we generate Brownian motion. So Brownian motion, as you can see, it is iterative process. So for uh, every time step, 
the new realization for Brownian motion. It's uh, generated by the previous uh, realization. So it's always a sample that was finished. Let's say the path stopped at some point. The next iteration will be the starting point for the new iteration is the end of the previous iteration. And then we have a square root of, uh, uh, of dt. So it's, um, as you remember, we have square root of time times uh, sample. So in this case, we take a z1, which is independent uh, sample. And for z2, it's the, this is the one which is generated already, and it is also correlated. So this is the one that we use here. And we have also running a time argument. This is not really relevant here. And then here uh, we use dictionary to store the results. So if I run the code, you can see that in the first case, we have a positive correlation. Sorry, it's a negative correlation. So one goes up, second goes down. Second case is a positive correlation. Uh, it does not mean that uh, the correlation, of course, here we have chosen correlation to 70%. Once you increase the correlation, those paths will resemble uh, uh, each other much better. And the third case is a zero correlation. So if we take, for example, for the first case, we make a correlation minus 90%, you will see a, a big, uh, it's a, it becomes more and more mirrored, right? For the second case, we have uh, actually here, now we have 70, this is a positive case, let's make also 90%. So you see those, once we increase the correlation, then the paths resemble each other better. Either it is a mirrored case, or it is uh, uh, just following the same pattern. And for zero, of course, it's zero, it's unrelated. Okay, um, let's go back to the slides. Uh, so this is uh, how we could simulate our uh, Monte Carlo paths for a correlated brown emotion. Uh, of course, in uh, uh, once we talk about uh, stochastic differential equations, uh, typically we have to deal also with uh, uh, higher dimensions, and this is how we do it. So if we you remember, we have a Cholesky decomposition, we have uh, independent brown emotions, uh, and by Cholesky decomposition, we can just work it out that at the end. This is, let's say, uh, in dimension independent. It works for every dimension that our output will be always correlation times dt. Um, there is nothing more to add except that uh, if you, for example, uh, deal with uh, correlations that you estimated from market data. So if you have, let's say, some uh, samples from uh, brown emotions and you estimate the correlations, once you have higher dimension of those uh, samples, so if multiple brown emotions, then you may encounter a problem that your relation matrix is not positive definite. And uh, once you encounter this problem, then of course your Cholesky decomposition is not going to work. For that reason, you need to apply certain algorithms that will map your matrix, which is not positive definite, that is positive definite. Uh, in practice, in models in finance, uh, once we apply Cholesky decomposition, we always make sure that inputs um, are satisfying um, the, the, the positive definiteness and the Cholesky decomposition is properly defined. Otherwise, especially if you try to calibrate correlation coefficient, you may end up in a situation when uh, you see uh, prices which are either imaginary, so there's a squared, for example, of a minus correlation number, or there is an, something goes very, very bad with your final outputs. And often that is because your correlation, uh, it is non-positive definite, so the correlation matrix is not positive definite. Or, for example, your algorithm, if you didn't specify bounds for your correlation coefficient, uh, could be that correlation become 10 or even minus 10 or, or so on. So uh, or such cases could also happen. So then you also have to make sure that your correlation coefficient, it is within a realistic bound. We know that's minus one and one. Um, if we talk about uh, uh, affine diffusion models, we always, we have defined the conditions when the model is affine diffusion, when be, be, belongs to affine class. And this was in the case when we had the independent brown emotions. So you can see that in the case of dependent brown emotions, so this is what we have, we have correlated brown emotions. Uh, we can represent our, in a multidimensional case, we may have a process, each process, so as you can see here, uh, X1, it may depend on all the brown emotions. That's very unusual, but in a, theoretically that's possible case. So we have, a, you see that this 
uh, pro this element will be multiplied with this one, and so on. So then you end up with uh, each process, in this case, would depend on all the correlated binary motions. Uh, however, in, uh, uh, in practice, we typically have uh, uh, uncorrelated binary motions, and then we just deal with coefficients, which are in front. So you can see that sigma uh, 1, 1 and that bar and sigma 1 n, those could be not only volatility coefficients, but those could be coefficients which come from uh, Cholesky decomposition. So this is what we have here. So uh, by using uh, correlation, if you have related binary motions, we can, with Cholesky, represent uh, the system of differential equations uh, in terms of independent binary motions, as we can see here, and the correlation will be here in the matrix C. So this is, uh, you can see C is inside. The correlation is with the volatility structure. And this comes from the Cholesky decomposition. And then we can represent our model in this way. Right, so we have independent brown emotions, we have a drift and we have a sigma. And the sigma, it's not only the volatility, but also relation between different brown emotions. And as you remember, this is similar what we have seen before when we talked about uh, affine diffusion and what kind of condition conditions need to hold such that this system is actually affine. So this is very important to keep in mind. And the, the most important element from this block is that Cholesky decomposition it's a very handy tool to uh, deal with uh, correlating brown emotions and also deal with uh, transforming a uh, system of equations which is correlated to uncorrelated and then imposing correlation via this decomposition. Uh, once we know how to correlate brown emotions, another thing we have to learn is how to apply Ito's lemma once we we have specified a system of correlated stochastic differential equations. For that purpose, we need to learn uh, and we need to know more details about Ito's lemma for vector processes. A vector processes is associated with a vector, which is given here, which is a vector consisting of multiple stochastic processes that possibly are correlated. Uh, to apply Ito's lemma, we have to, as we have done before, we have to define function g, which is sufficiently differentiable. Before, once we, in a case when, when we had Black-Scholes model, function g was defined as, uh, for example, uh, a logarithm, logarithm of st. So you see, this was one-dimensional case. Now we have uh, some generic function that may depend on uh, multiple uh, var multiple entries uh, of this vector, right? So in this case, we have S, but this is, could be generic to any uh, vector, any process X. Um, the condition which is uh, typically satisfied is much more uh, technical condition that this function G has to be uh, sufficiently differentiable. So for example, here we, of course, we didn't have a problem with that. Then the increment, so basically uh, the dynamics, so once we talk about the increments and we have processes, then we typically talk about the uh, dynamics of a process is driven by the following uh, SDEs and by the following multidimensional stochastic differential equation. So as before, we had uh, uh, a drift term, so it's a derivative with respect to a time times the t. Then we have to go through all the processes that we have in a vector, we differentiate function g with each of them and then multiply with a dxj. So this is uh, uh, the first order derivative. And then we have a second order derivative with, with half, and then we have to do it for the cross terms. Only one thing we have to keep in mind is, of course, uh, these processes uh, dxi and dxj. And for that, we will use, of course, again, Ito's table. Of course, in the case of multidimensionality, uh, our Ito's table is more in, uh, uh, is extended. This means we also have to deal with a Brownian motions, the i, t, and uh, the w, j, t. And then we have a uh, d, t here, right? So uh, for this is, of course, for i uh, being different than j. So this is, let's say, an extension of our ethos table that we have seen already uh, before. And maybe not clear here. So here it says uh, rho times d, t. Okay, um, so this is essentially application of a Taylor series, an application of a ethos table. So this is how you always you think about uh, ethos lemma is about uh, uh, Taylor's series uh, in which the 
uh, the ethos table is included. So this is um, this is this part is in terms of uh, matrices that we have seen already before. So vectors we have for sigma i k and sigma j k. So this will be in a terms of independent Brownian motions, for example. So once we decompose our processes x to be in, given in terms of independent Brownian motions, this is the expression what we will get. In practice, once we have correlated Brownian motions and we want to apply ETO, there's no need to make Cholesky decomposition. We could just simply apply uh, ETO's table. And that's that's typically um, enough. Um, this term, this representation, once we deal with uh, independent Brownian motions and Cholesky, that makes it ETO lemma a little bit more complicated you have to really take care of all the vectors that they are there. So for uh, for ethos, uh, ethos lemma application to multidimensional SDs, I recommend to use correlated variants of that. However, it is still possible to do it with uncorrelated. But as you can see, we can simply switch between a correlated and uncorrelated uh, Brownian motions, depending what you need. And here is an example. So here we have uh, we consider uh, two-dimensional Brownian motion. So we have a correlated Brownian motion with some relation raw. And we construct uh, a portfolio of uh, two stocks. So we have two stocks which have uh, uh, some drift. So we, as you can see, very likely our brown emotion is defined under real world measure P because the drifts they are not equal to R, to money savings, and the rate R is not money savings account rate. So this means that very likely those parameters were estimated on historical data. We have a uh, some two drifts and we have a sigma one sigma two and we have correlated brown emotion so this is there is a correlation here um, those parameters we assume to be constant we know that we can go further we can assume uh, sigma one and sigma to be stochastic we can even think of a Hessel model but that will be uh, later if we apply now Cholesky decomposition to represent the system uh, essentially, most of the elements will be the same. So you can see we have uh, DS1, DS2, drift is the same. Now we have only Cholesky decomposition where we say, okay, first term, we have uh, independent, first independent Brownian motion, then we have sigma1 S1T, which will be here. And then we have a second term, so we know that will be correlation. This is the correlation from Cholesky. Then we have a squared one minus rho squared. And both two these two terms are multiplied with the coefficients volatility term, which is here, right? So we could also do the same once we perform, for example, log transformation. So we can, from here, we move to log space, log S T, sorry, S, S T one. And we could do the same here, log S S T two. So that's also possible. We can also do it in a log space. It doesn't really matter. Uh, the most important element is that in a, if we apply Cholesky, we just have to keep track where the correlations are and make sure that the volatilities correspond uh, to proper volatilities, which are here. OK, so um, once we have that, so once we have uh, done this decomposition, we can make a, a next step and we can move to a multidimensional uh, ethos lemma. So we have function g for which we want to apply uh, ethos lemma to find out the dynamics of uh, following form. So we are looking for the dynamics of function g, t, s1, s2. Uh, in practice, uh, that is possible that we will consider multidimensional basket of uh, stocks. Uh, however, not often. Not often we will have any specific function involving more than uh, two variables. So I would say in uh, most of the cases, Ito's lemma will be limited to three, maybe uh, two, three dimensions. Maybe in the case of LIBOR market model, we have to deal with a higher dimension, but that's uh, not so uh, open. And especially in this course, you are not going to uh, those difficult cases. So if we apply uh, ethos, we have uh, a DGTS1, and then we have, of course, uh, some terms. Those terms resemble the ones we have already seen before. We have derivative with respect to time. We have uh, drift terms for, for stock one and stock two. We have volatility terms. So this is exactly as we have seen for Black Shoals. So those terms are exactly the same, except that we have one additional term which comes from the, so there is a half missing, right? Because in summations, we do two times 
the same post term, so with a correlation rho times sigma 1, sigma 2, s1, s2, and then we have a, a here mixed derivative of g to s1 and s2 with respect to s1 and s2. Once the correlation is zero, obviously this term will be gone, so then it's a, it's a simplified case. And then we also have a, a Brownian motions. As you can see that in this case, we could just consider this example uh, a correlated Brownian motions, and so that doesn't really change uh, anything. So once, like I said before, once you apply Ito's lemma, it is not necessary to switch to independent Brownian motions, having independent Brownian motions, but making sure that you are properly handling uh, Ito's table, uh, then it is typically sufficient. So if, for example, we have uh, uh, addition, so if we define a simplistic case where we have a G function, uh, which have uh, uh, we have a t s1 and s2 to only be the logarithm of s1, then we have a result that we already seen before. This is just a black Scholes case. So you see that we can also, for multi-dimensional case, we can always collapse to the simplest case. So this is the, something that we already have seen. It was uh, the x1 t, right? So this is just a famous black Scholes, of course, with uh, under real world measure p. Once we know how to apply multidimensional Ito's lemma to multidimensional stochastic differential equations, we can go a step further and apply Ito's lemma in order to derive uh, pricing PD for Heston model for the Heston model. So um, for for doing that, for deriving the pricing PD for the Heston model, we will follow the the Martingale approach, so so called Martingale method. We already have discussed earlier. In a um, in a summary, you can think of uh, um, the following condition, we have a V at initial time T. So if we have a value of a derivative discounted to today is equal as expectation, you can think of this, expectation of a value in the future discounted to today. So essentially, this is the, the, the condition that needs to hold for any derivative in essence. So this is a risk neutral measure because we are discounting with the money savings account and MT is the money savings account uh, driven by, of course, we know the, already um, the equation for it is RMDT. So this is the condition which essentially implies what is the PD for any model if we talk about the pricing. In this case, of course, we start with a pricing of European type option. Uh, but the difficulty part, or more, let's say something which is more involved than before, is that our option, so our value of a derivative, does not depend explicitly only on S, but also there is an additional variance process. Um, we could also go via regular approach once we talk about uh, replicating portfolio, but you can imagine that there is a little bit more difficult because once you talk about replicating portfolio, you have to make sure or you have to be carefully think how you're going to handle the fact that the variance that we're observing, so the variance process, is nothing observable, right? So you need to make a special hedge for variance that you cannot just buy and sell. Once you have a portfolio of stocks or some market products, obviously those products you can simply buy or sell. You can define like we did for a portfolio delta hedge to offset movements in a portfolio or in a value in your portfolio. However, if you have a, a variable which is stochastic, it is not uh, observable. This means it's not tradable. You cannot really use it in hedging. Then for that reason, uh, um, pricing or deri deriving of a pricing equation uh, in this case, that will be much more involved. However, the details for that we provided in the book. So please, um, if you're interested, I refer you to that. So the, the, the approach here, we will have a Martingale approach, which I always consider to be one of the simplest approaches to achieve the pricing equation. And note that this condition, which is here, it's already uh, the equation, I think I repeated about 10 times in this course, because it's one of the crucial equations that always need to hold. If this condition does not hold, uh, although it's simple, although this equation is straightforward, if, for example, you change V to S, you know exactly what to expect. Uh, but if something goes wrong, this equation is not going to hold. So that's a kind of key element. On the other hand, this equation is so powerful that also allows us to find out what is the proper price 
what is a fair price for a, a contract and the risk neutral measure Q. So, okay, so we know that this is a Martingale, so discounted value of a future derivative has to be Martingale. Otherwise, obviously, that will be a, uh, there will be a, an arbitrage opportunity, right? So that's why we have discounted future value of a payoff to today. It's equal to the value of a derivative that you see today. Otherwise, there is an arbitrage opportunity. Okay, so this is what we actually have here, right? So it's the same equation with uh, value, and we define this V over M to be equal to pi. So, of course, first step, what we have to do, we have to make sure that this is a, a martingale, this quantity is the martingale. To achieve that, to find out with that, we need to apply Ito's lemma. So by Ito's lemma, so it's a V over M, uh, simple derivative, we have 1 over M dV minus R V over M dt. So you see, it is very straightforward. Um, there is not so much involvement. Of course, uh, M is very simple, right? It's defined just here. It's uh, um, So to summarize, we also have the So our economy consists of uh, uh, its incomplete market. So we have uh, an asset, stock. We have uh, a volatility, which is not tradable and we have still money savings account so this is important once we talk about the dynamics here so money savings account is simple we have dt and of course this term is is more involved because this means this is a value of our option which depends on uh, stock but also depends on the variance which is related via correlation to the stock so this is something that we have to uh, take a closer look um, to apply Ito's lemma, so this is basically a solution, you essentially would apply the Taylor's uh, uh, series. Uh, but let me take a look here. Let's let's derive something uh, together. So um, one of the most important uh, terms, so if we talk about uh, Ito's, you will have a derivative of a, a function g, or actually we have a value v with respect to time, then we have a derivative of v with respect to s, ds plus derivative with respect to of v with respect to volatility d v and then we of course we will have also cross term so we have uh, half of v squared s s squared ds squared we also have half of uh, v squared D, D squared and we of course we have a cross term which will be second order derivative of v v s d v d s so of course those terms you can easily handle this is what we already have done so for that you need only ito stable this term is a little bit more involved because it involves a product of a, a variance process and also the stock so for that i will do it here to, to illustrate for um, first let's start with a stock process for under the Heston model we have uh, interest rate S T D T plus we have here square root of V T D W here we call it one T and for the variance we have D V T is equal to and here we have a mean reversion your long term mean minus v t d t plus gamma squared of v d d w two t. So once we talk about the product, of course, those we have to multiply each element by each other. So of course, d t d t this is zero. d t times Brownian motion is also zero. Those will be also gone. So only what we have left from here. So if we talk about uh, uh, d s t d v t, we are only left with a uh, square root of v t times gamma times square root actually so i'm missing here an element here because there should be also st here right so we are having uh, v t times s t and we have d w1 t times d w2 t so obviously we will end up with a gamma times v t times s t times correlation raw times 
dt because we know that this term it is equal to correlation rho times dt. So this is only one, one element which I would say this is uh, extra that what we haven't seen before. Except for that we have uh, two Brownian motions. Uh, we have two processes that we have to plug in here. For that we will have this term will be S squared uh, Vt. For this term we will end up with a gamma squared times Vt and only one which is left which is cross term. Uh, for those we just substitute those processes which also would involve uh, a dt term. Okay, so once we have done uh, here, so uh, we have dv and then we have a, a first order derivative with respect to time. Then we collect all the dt terms. So this is the interest, the, the part with a drift from stock, part corresponding to the uh, drift of the volatility. We have a, a second order term. So this will be half v squared s squared. I think this is about also what we have derived here, right? Yes, yeah, so we will have um, uh, s squared. If we talk about this term, so we have a v s squared. Right? This is correct. And then we also have here the cross term, so which is the correlation times gamma s v. And then we have a cross term from the, let's say, the second order term, the product of uh, gamma squared v. And then those are the terms that we, we obtain just simply from, uh, from diffusive part. So, of course, we know that uh, if we substitute, so the next step, so once we derive dv, we have to substitute into here, and then we have to collect all the terms. Then once we collect all the terms to uh, d pi v, uh, this means that uh, uh, d pi has to be martingale. This means that all the drift terms from this expression for d pi, they have to be equal to, uh, to zero. And this is what we end up with. So once we make sure that uh, uh, this expression for d pi is, uh, is driftless, so every term which is dt term has to be equal to zero. And this is what we end up with. Uh, you see we divide, we have a 1 over m in the beginning here. We also have over uh, v over m here. This means we can multiply uh, both sides of equation with m. This means this will be gone and also this will be gone. And this is our pricing p for the for the Heston model. Only one thing is uh, missing is, of course, the specification of the terminal condition, the final condition for the PDE. So once we uh, specify that condition, once we know what kind of payoff we want to price. So if your uh, condition involves uh, option, let's say European call or put option, then obviously your boundary condition is straightforward. It, it can also involve uh, path dependent, so your value uh, at the end would be, uh, let's say, is not only uh, terminal dependent at a given time, but could also depend on the history of movement of the underlying stock. So this is why the boundary condition, the terminal condition is not specified. It's very much dependent on the purpose of your derivation. Later, we will use Heston model for pricing of exotic derivatives. But of course, uh, before we get there, we also need to know how to price options, European type options. So European type, this means only payment takes place at given maturity uh, using Fourier techniques. And this will happen uh, very shortly. The greatest advantage of the Heston model compared to the Black Shoals, its flexibility and also stochasticity of the variance process. In the Black Shoals model, the variance was simply a constant, so sigma squared. In the Heston model, we have a, a stochastic differential equation. This stochastic differential equation, this SDE, involves multiple parameters. We have kappa, we have a long-term mean, so speed of mean reversion, long-term mean, volatility of volatility, and there is one more parameter, correlation. So we, in total, we have uh, four parameters that we can calibrate our model to, uh, to implant volatility is minus Q. There is one more parameter that we don't see, is actually initial value of the variance process. So this is additional parameter than what we can use, that we can use to calibrate the model. In this block, we will be concentrating on uh, different impacts, on a, we will be analyzing impact of different parameter changes on implied volatility smiles and skews. For that reason, we specify number of parameters. So it's a correlation which is to zero, uh, mean reversion to one, uh, volatility of volatility to 0 0.1, 
we have an initial value of 5%, long term mean is 10%. So we keep those parameters fixed, we'd be varying those parameters one by one and observing the impact on implied volatility shape. Uh, the greatest advantage of this uh, model is actually that each of these parameters has individual impact uh, on the volatility shape. So this means by changing one parameter, you can control particular either skew, smile, curvature, level, etc. And this will be observed in the uh, following uh, slides. Maybe one thing to mention, uh, something we already discussed before, um, the implied volatility will be calculated using Newton Robson. So again, once we talk about implied volatilities, it is not implied volatility of Aston model, but it's a Black-Scholes implied volatility, which is obtained by generating prices from the Heston model, then those prices are plugged into the Black-Scholes formula or inverted Black-Scholes formula, so that we know that we look at the Black-Scholes implied volatilities. First parameter to observe is uh, gamma, volatility of volatility, and correlation rho. So we can see here that by uh, once the gamma of volatility of volatility increases, we uh, can control the curvature of implied volatility. So we have here, we can see different level of strikes. We start with a rather flat, rather skewed implied volatility shape. And by increasing gamma, we see it's getting more and more and more curvature. If we have gamma, for example, two, very likely we get a shape even much more steep. It will be more of something like this. So it is uh, a curvature is controlled by vol vol gamma parameter. On the other hand, if we look at correlations, uh, correlation has slightly different effect. So let's look at the case when we have a zero. You see the correlation, zero correlation actually corresponds to smile. And this is rather typical to stochastic volatility models that if we have a zero correlation, and we don't have any dis the so called uh, displaced diffusion parameters, then we typically have a, a smile in the model. Um, as you can see in this experiment, we have uh, correlations which are only negative. And there are two reasons for that. The first reason is that Heston model is proven to have problems with moments uh, when correlations are positive. So this means that moments uh, can explode. Um, that's very theoretical uh, finding, but it actually it's possible theoretically. On the other hand, uh, if you think of a stock and stock market crashes, you would expect that once market stock goes down, volatility would increase. So there is a negative uh, correlation between these two processes. Uh, what we can see here is that once we increase the correlation in absolute terms, then the skewness increases. So curvature is always about uh, uh, this. Gamma Volvo is about curvature. Uh, correlation is about uh, skew. This is the takeaway. Uh, other parameter that we are going to look at is uh, uh, speed of mean reversion, kappa. Um, you can see that if you look at the uh, strikes, so implied volatility shapes, uh, it's kind of difficult to interpret, right? So we see a little bit of an increase in skew once kappa, for small kappa, we have a rather steeper skew. And then once we increase kappa, the skew becomes flattened, plus the level is affected, especially for large strikes. But the most important effect of uh, speed of mean reversion is not its impact on uh, uh, on a level of implant volatilities, but rather effect on a term structure of implant volatilities. And this can be seen in the second picture. Uh, so we have here, we have here uh, a graph presenting uh, implied volatilities, but not for changing strikes as we had here, but for changing maturity. So we have an add the money option. So it's add the money call or put option doesn't really matter because prices will be the same. The implied volatilities will be the same. And what we do, we take at the money and then we plot uh, implied volatilities for at the money level. However, we change maturity of the option. So you can see that uh, mean reversion, speed of mean reversion shows you how fast. So we have initial level, which is here, which is around uh, 5%, 5% of variance. Of course, this means we need to take a square root, which is around 22% of implied volatility. And then we have a, a long term mean, which is 10% which is around square root of a long term mean is around 3162. So this is this is the level, the, the final level. This is the initial level. And once we talk about uh, kappa, you see that depending on uh, kappa, so larger the kappa, 
faster the term structure of implied volatilities converges to the long term mean. If we have a kappa which is very small, like here we had a 10, uh, 0.1, so it's a 10%, we have a kappa which converges very, very slow. You can see that it will only reach that high level of implied volatility and then a long term mean in a many, many years. So it's maybe even here could be 200, 300 years. Uh, so this is this is the, the the most important impact of kappa. It tells you about the term structure of under money implied volatilities, and this is what we also have seen in uh, in a graphs before when implied volatility smile changes. So we could also so, uh, so changes in times of volatility goes up or down. Um, this is also an effect that you could obtain a similar effect once we talk about under money implied volatility. Once we talk about Black Scholes model with implied volatil with volatility parameter which is time dependent, they could also control the term structure of implied volatilities. Uh, next two parameters which have very similar effect are the uh, long term mean, so V bar and V zero. You can see that mainly if we look at uh, 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 this is yeah. So for V bar, uh, we have here only one graph for a strike, so V bar essentially tells you level. If you have given maturity, so it's a maturity T, then we only control the level. And of course, if we have a, a shorter maturity, this level will be closer to the, uh, somewhere in between initial and long-term uh, long mean. So long-term mean, it's a, you can see that's a, just a level. Um, on the other hand, if you look at uh, uh, initial, initial parameters of V0, uh, then we also have to look at the, at the term structure for that. So what is the impact of implied volatility once we have a different maturity of options? And you can see that if we have a, a V0 of 10, it's basically, it's a similar story as we could see for uh, uh, for Kappa. So you can see that it's uh, for 10, it's basically rather, or actually the initial we had for the variance, it's indeed close to, uh, it's almost 5%. So, so, so V bar is 10, we are 10% for V bar, for V0 we have, you know, we change V0. So you see that we can control also the convergence in long term uh, to our, uh, our level. So here is, you can see that we have a, a V0 is equal to V bar. So this is V bar here, and this is equal to this 31, this is what we have seen, 31.6%. So this means it already converged to that level, so there is no more movement. Once we increase V0, uh, basically means the volatilities have to uh, converge downwards towards this uh, long-term uh, uh, long level. Once we look at implied volatilities and compare, let's say, Heston implied volatilities to Black Scholes, it is very easy to see whether uh, we, we have to do, do with uh, Heston model or Black Scholes. Obviously, for Black Scholes case, implant volatilities will be just flat, so there is nothing to uh, investigate. Uh, if the vol volatilities, implant volatilities, are non-flat, this means that we have to do with much more advanced model. Let's take a look now at uh, uh, not only at the implant volatilities, but let's try to figure it out whether we can see impact of uh, uh, different models on option prices. So for this reason. We consider here uh, option prices. So this is the prices for, for call option for different strikes where we have a rather good match. So we have a chosen set of parameters for Heston model. And we try to see whether if we use Black Scholes model with a fixed uh, sigma. So in this case, you can see sigma is a, a square root of the initial variance. Of course, uh, the, the mapping of uh, five parameters of Heston model to one parameter of Black Scholes is not really uh, straightforward, right? Because we will lose a lot of information. But this is just for illustrative reasons. Uh, what can we say about the prices? If I show you the prices, will you be able to show me which model generated those prices? So here are two graphs. So one hand side, we know that for Heston model, we have we can control implied smiles Q is typically associated with uh, uh, fatter tails. And this is what you could think here, right? So we have a, a Black Scholes model, which for a low strike, which uh, already at its strike, the value becomes zero. Then you could easily conclude, okay, a black line represents the Heston model. 
On the other hand, if I increase volatility for Black Shoals to 60%, so instead of square root of uh, V0, I take 60%, um, it doesn't work anymore, right? So you can see that black line, which is the Heston model, it converged much faster to zero, however, Black Shoals is uh, still performing, the values are much higher. And from this, although you interpret maybe correctly the impact of the model, of the model parameters on uh, prices in this case, because you just thought of uh, fatter tails, uh, more steep distribution, the same strategy would not work if we talk about this approach. In general, uh, unfortunately, it is always the case that by looking at the prices, it is very difficult to conclude about the uh, implied volatility shape. So this is something to keep in mind. Prices is not the way to see whether your model it is has enough parameters to calibrate to implied volatility smile or not. Uh, of course, if you have um, market prices and you calibrate it perfectly to those market prices, it's very big chance that, uh, or actually it is almost certain that implied volatility shapes uh, from the market and the model will be the same. However, always keep in mind that if you deal with uh, out of the money options, where the differences between out of the money options is very, very small, even small difference between the model and the market can lead to rather big differences in implied volatilities. This is why often when we talk about the calibration of stochastic volatility model or in general volatilities, it is preferred to calibrate to implied volatility options, especially out of the money options. Uh, later in this course, I'll provide you more details about the model calibration uh, and how to look at it. Uh, I will also give you some hints how to choose parameters uh, without actually calibrating the model, such that the model that you have, the parameters, will be quite okay calibrated without actually doing really advanced calibration. But this comes from the fact, this comes, let's say, uh, this fact of uh, calibration without doing calibration, you can only do it to a certain extent, of course, you cannot have perfect calibration, but this comes, it's related to the uh, fact that if you understand what is the implied volatility shape, implied volatility skew and smile, you understand how, where to look at and how to look at it, you can have a good feeling and good, you can provide good estimation for model parameters. And later in this course, I will give you some heuristic uh, ideas how to think of calibration of the Heston model to the uh, impact volatility is given in the market. Um, the last part of this block is about uh, comparisons to Black Scholes. So, of course, uh, the first conclusion is that by looking at the prices, you cannot really conclude whether uh, you have to deal with a Heston model or Black Scholes model. It, the, the differences are much more subtle and you have to look at uh, 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 different elements. And, for example, you have to look at uh, uh, densities. So by looking at the log returns, for example, you can see a heavier tails. Heavier tails, it means that if you look at the far end strikes, you will see differences between tail behavior. But that's sometimes quite difficult to see once you look at the prices, because those values that you deal with, those are very, very small. Heavier tail, of course, it means that it's not uh, 0.1, right? You, you, we talk about uh, the convergence. So for every uh, every element that you go further in the tail, that there is a higher probability of being there. Uh, so uh, heavier tails, but this is not observable from the from the option prices. Um, the volatility smile, this is something what we have already seen. The volatility shapes can be well represented, can be well controlled. We can have a different uh, shape impact we have by different model parameters. So by changing model parameters, you could see we could have a really rather rich collection of different volatility shapes. And finally, the following pricing PDE we have derived for, for, the, Heston, for the Heston model. Uh, the only element that I would say uh, it is uh, more, uh, of course, this is two-dimensional PDE, but one element that is, uh, we spent quite some time in this lecture was about the relation of, uh, let's say, application of Ito's lemma and Cholesky decomposition to get this cross term. This is very important, and this tells you this. You can think of a linking uh, volatility with uh, with a stock, and that correlation effect, correlation impact, it is uh, uh, very important. Of course, once we talk about correlation and uh, say historical data calibration, market prices, if we calibrate our model to European prices or European 
option implied volatilities uh, with the correlation coefficient is not chosen based on some historical data. It is chosen based on the market uh, prices for options. So typically this coefficient for correlation, it is just implied from a calibrated model, but it's not estimated on the historical data. So this is something to, to keep in mind. On the other hand, uh, you would need to also think what does it mean volatility? What does it mean stochastic volatility? Which quantity would you actually observe in the market to say that this is actual stochastic volatility? So this is additional uh, difficulty. So far, we have learned that the Helston model is superior to the Black-Scholes model. It allows us to price derivatives with that they are sensitive to implied volatility, smile, skew. Uh, we have also derived pricing PDE, and finally, we have checked the impact of model parameters on different shapes of implied volatilities, smiles, and skews. The, the only one question at this point that is left is, can we derive the characteristic function for the Hester model? Is this model actually affine? And this is what we are going to do now. So for the Hester model, of course, we have a two-dimensional SDE with correlation between brown emotions wrong. Uh, to, to first step to, uh, to check whether this model is affine, whether we can find the characteristic function, is checking whether all the state variables and uh, squared volatility or squared covariance matrix are linear in a state uh, vector. So basically, first of all, we see that we have a, a vector consisting of uh, two state variables. We have uh, S, T, and we have a variance T. Okay, so this is our state vector. Um, let's, let's inspect first the drifts. We see interest rate, we have a S. So obviously this uh, drift, it's linear in S. So this, is, this satisfies the condition of being linear in a state of variables. Then if we look at the drift of the second process, we see kappa V bar, so it's a constant, minus kappa v, uh, VT. This is also linear in a state vector is linear in VT. Now the most difficult part is about the instantaneous covariance matrix. Uh, how to look at it? Essentially, we start with uh, uh, the shortest way to, to derive uh, instantaneous covariance matrix is looking at the, all the squares and intersection, the cross terms between Brownian motions. So here we say, okay, for the first term, this will be this term, we make it squared, and this is the first element of this matrix. Uh, the second process would give us the second element squared. It would be this process, this element of this matrix. And on the counter diagonal, we would have a product of these two brown emotions. So the first, of course, not, if you just multiply square this term, we also would have a dt at the end, right? So this is... Uh, uh, rather straightforward. So if we square square, uh, square to VST, we have a VT as squared. Obviously, this is not linear in state variables. If we go further, we also have for the variance, we see that we will have a, a gamma squared V. So this is actually linear in, uh, in V. And for the cross terms, we see that we have ST, VT, uh, gamma uh, correlation rho. So this is also not linear because we have a product of two uh, state variables. Even if we choose correlation, so correlation will be zero, this term will be gone, we have still problem with the, uh, with the first term. So this is similar as we have seen already for the Black-Scholes model, is that if we have a, a stock which is also in the volatility and we consider GBM, geometric brown emotion, this exponential um, type of process, then the process is not going to be linear in a state variables. Um, the same as for the Black-Scholes model, we have to first perform the logarithmic transformation. And luckily, uh, although the model is more involved, uh, it does, does, does not complicate uh, our derivations. So after, uh, after performing the log transformation, we have uh, xt equal to log of st. Uh, so now our state vector of t, it is equal to xt, uh, vt. So you see that right now we are not looking anymore on the state vector uh, with regards to s and v, but we have x and v. So now we have to check whether the cross terms, all the terms are linear uh, with respect to these, uh, this vector, the state space. 
Um, interest rate, of course, this is a constant, so forget about this. But of course, the same, it is linear in a, in a state space. So we have a, a VT, so that's the constant minus half of VT, linear, this is fine. For the variance, it's the same as with before, it's also good. And here what we have, if we look at this covariance matrix, we will have a, a square root of VT squared, so it's a VT. Uh, for this term here, we would have a gamma squared VT. And for the cross term, we would have a gamma VT times correlation. Gamma VT times the correlation. This is also what is actually confirmed in this case. So you can see that in this matrix, everything, uh, because actually we have correlation, which is uh, uh, constant, gamma is parameter gamma is constant, this is linear each state variables. And this is the easiest way to check whether your process is, uh, is fine or not. You look at the instantaneous covariance matrix, and then you check on the, whether all the cross terms are essentially linear in state uh, variables. So, of course, we don't have any jumps, so we don't need to check that. Interest rate, we consider the model with a constant interest rate, that this is also fine. Therefore, model is, is affine and we can derive the characteristic function. Uh, derivation of the characteristic function for the Heston model, it is rather involved. Uh, I would like to, to refer you to the book where you can see all the details regarding these uh, derivations. It's, uh, uh, I think, about uh, two or three pages of uh, uh, deriving and solving Riccati type of uh, ODEs. Uh, in here, in this slide, I just uh, collected the uh, solution. So we have a characteristic function for the Heston model. It is a uh, phi levy uh, or a phi, actually in general, this is generic general case for levy processes. For Heston model, we also have phi with x v0. Then we have a characteristic function of Heston, which is derived here, and times e u x. So this is kind of a handy decomposition that you will see later in this course that uh, facilitates us with uh, very efficient and fast pricing, this kind of decomposition. Overall, you can actually also include IUX in this exponent here, so it doesn't really matter. You see all those terms are explicit. We don't need to perform any analytical, uh, any uh, numerical uh, computations to get this characteristic uh, uh, function. And, and this is also one of the greatest advantages of this model, that in the case of Heston model, um, the characteristic function, the ODEs for the uh, characteristic function, the, the ODEs that we have to uh, solve according to the Duffy pattern and Singleton, those are in closed form. Even for piecewise constant parameters of the Heston model, we can have uh, ODEs uh, explicitly solved, so that's not a, uh, not a big problem. And that actually facilitates the computation and fast calibration of the model.